Well, I've heard an academic defined as someone who is happy to give a lecture at a bus stop. So <laughs> g giving a talk at, at Brady. I'm sorry that uh, Kathleen Akins couldn't make it, but I'm happy to fill in. This is a talk I'm giving next week in Bristol, so it was all ready to go. Uh, actually, it was 12 years ago that I organized the first Brain Day. This is number, number 13. I'm delighted it's been so successful on an ongoing basis, thanks to the work of Chris Eliasmith and, and Britt Anderson. Uh, but it's been really fun to see this kind of combination of philosophy, neuroscience, psychology, and computer modeling all in one place. I actually remember 12 years ago, Jeff Hinton was one of the speakers, and he gave one of his first talks, I guess, about his new way of doing neural network stuff, which eventually became deep learning, for which he just won the Turing Prize, which is the top prize in. Yeah. So that's one of many highlights we've had over the 12 years. Uh, so um, today I'm going to talk about creativity in art and science. The conference I'm at in Bristol is actually on creativity in art and science. And the big interesting question is, what's the relation between creativity in art and creativity in science? Obviously, there are lots of creativity in both those people. And I actually have come over the years, partly through this talk, but through a couple of previous papers, to think that it's basically the same. It's all the same brain, and it's brain, understanding brain mechanisms that can help you to see that it's at a, a deep level what seem to be very different kinds of creativity, what painters do versus what scientists do or what engineers do. It's all the same brain. I'm going to try to make the case for that. But first, uh, let me ask you a question. I'll just give you a minute to think about this. What do you think is the most creative uh, idea that humans have ever had? I won't do a poll, but just think of something. I'm sure you can all think of at least one in art or science or technology or, or social innovation. These are all important areas. But uh, Dave Barry is an American humorist, and he has an interesting theory about this. He said the most creative idea that humans ever got was pizza. <laughs> and he said, well, you know, the wheel is pretty cool, but it doesn't go nearly as well with beer. <laughs> So by that standard, I guess beer should be the most creative thing that humans ever done. Well, I've got a different answer to that question. It's not a question I had until really just a month or two ago. Uh, it's cooking. Why is cooking so important? Because according to some fairly recent theories, that's what made everything else possible. Uh, so this is an old theory of, uh, by an anthropologist named Richard Wrangham 20 years ago. But I never took it that seriously until I read a book by Susanna Herculana Huzel. I'm going to be talking about today, where she mentions the, that cooking is seen really important for the dramatic increase in size of the brain that took place about a million and a half years ago. About a million and a half years ago, a Homo erectus figured out how not only to control fire, but to use it to cook food. And that made possible the dramatic increase in the size of the brain. Primate brains have been increasing sort of slowly. But with Homo erectus, you see a dramatic increase in the size of human brains, especially in the amount, a number of neurons in the prefrontal cortex. Uh, and so then that made possible lots of the other kinds of creativity that I might have been talking about. Um, so I'm going to be talking about cooking, but I'm also going to be talking about uh, uh, Herculana Huzel's really interesting work because she figured out how to count neurons. So the standard view until 2003 when she got interested in this is that the brain contains about 100 billion neurons. But she was curious. She said, well, what's the basis for that? And so she talked to all the leading figures in neuroscience. And they said, well, everybody knows it's around 100 billion. And she said, well, how do you know that? And nobody had an answer. It turns out it wasn't based on any kind of empirical research. So she decided she was going to come up with a different a, a method. You could actually reliably count the number of neurons, not just in human brains, but also in rats and gorillas and so on. And so she came up with her own method, which she calls brain soup. Uh, uh, so the, the title for this talk easily could have been more catchier, something like cooking cubism and brain soup. How does, how, how does cubism get into it? Well, cubism was an incredibly revolutionary movement in painting, taking place around 1907 by Picasso and Georges Braque. And it was really revolutionary because it was a move away from art that was really representational. Even the Impressionists had slightly unusual kinds of representations, but they were doing representations of the world. But as you can see from this picture of Picasso's, this is his painting, uh, Girl with a Mandolin that you can kind of see a mandolin there, and you can kind of see that it's a girl, but it's incredibly abstract. And it was really cubism that opened up the possibilities of later 20th century 
art uh, such as abstract expressionism where it became farther and farther removed from what's representational. So cubism was an extremely uh, original thing. So these are three examples of creativity. But what I want you to notice, it's a particular kind of creativity that I call procedural creativity. It's creativity not just about ideas or hypotheses, it's creativity about methods. So what I mean by procedural creativity is coming up with new methods. So cooking is a method. It's a method of preparing food. Uh, cubism isn't just a single work of art. It's many works of art using a common method. And brain soup uh, is not just a particular discovery. It was a way of making discoveries that's turned out to be really quite fertile. So here's the question that I'm interested in. How do brains operate with procedural creativity? OK, so here's my outline. I'm going to start by distinguishing different products of creativity and then describe procedural creativity as new methods. And I'll give you a bunch of examples to try to convince you that actually procedural creativity is more important than all the other kinds of creativity. Because once you have a new method, then you can go on and do a bunch of other kinds of discoveries of the other sort. How, how can we understand that? Well, we need an account of how the results of procedural creativity, namely new methods, are represented in the mind, represented in the brain. And I'll propose a, a neural explanation of that. And then I'll talk about mechanisms, can be understood as psychological mechanisms and equally well as neural mechanisms for how this goes about. And I think the three major ways in which procedural creativity works, whether it's uh, in cooking or, or art or science, is going to be using combination of representations, generalizations from successes, but also uh, analogy. I meant to mention that uh, when I came up with the idea for Brain Day uh, 12 years ago, it was actually by analogy, because I'd been reading some article and it mentioned Montreal Pain Day. And I figured, well, if Montreal can have a pain day, we should be able to have a brain day, uh, which would probably be a lot more fun. And, and, and it certainly has been more fun. Uh, but then, in order to address the question of what's the relation between artistic creativity and uh, scientific creativity, I'm going to do a detailed comparison of these two cases, cubism and brain soup, and show that the same kinds of psychological and neural mechanisms are operating in both. Of course, there's differences that I'll point out, but the main neural uh, components are the same. OK, so products of creativity. People often have written, there's large literatures on creativity in psychology and philosophy, neuroscience, computer science. They usually pay attention to things like the development of new concepts, concepts like the atom or the atomic bomb, or a hospital is an example of a social innovation. So con new concepts are definitely an important part of creativity. But you also want to come up with new hypotheses. You want to be able to explain things. You want to bring in ideas like attention in the previous talk, not just as a description, but as an explanation of how the mind is working. Uh, you also want to sometimes discover things, such as the wheel or the moons of Jupiter. Uh, one of my favorite social innovations was the University of Bologna, which was the first university. And so that was a, a new kind of, of entity that got produced. Um, particular works of art, such as the Mona Lisa. But my talk today is about particular kinds of methods where in order to be able to get more concepts or more hypotheses or new things, you come up with new methods in order to be able to advance things. In uh, neuroscience, for example, we see many really important experimental methods, such as uh, single cell recording we heard uh, in the previous talk, such as uh, uh, brain scanning technologies of different sorts, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, the optogenetics that was mentioned, these have all been important empirical methods in neuroscience. But you also have the development of, I think, a really powerful theoretical approach, namely theoretical neuroscience based on mathematics and computer modeling. That uh, is an important part of what goes on too. So the question is, what's the nature of these methods and how do we come up with them? So here's some more examples for both science and art. Uh, this is not an exclusive list at all. I mean, this is just 10 of what I think are some of the most important methods that science has come up with. Probably what got science going around uh, 2,700 years ago was the realization by the Greek philosopher scientist Thales that we could give explanations of things in a completely natural way. Explanations before that time have been largely religious or theological. Why is there thunder? Oh, it's because the gods are making that kind of noise. What Thales did was to think, no, we don't need to do that. 
we can look at natural phenomena and uh, explain them just by physical processes. So that was really important. Also important was the invention of experimentation, the idea that you don't just observe things, you actually kind of control them and figure out what happens. And as far as I know, that originated with the uh, Arab uh, uh, scientist Ibn al-Haytham in around 1021, sometime around then. There were also early Arab scientists who came up with the idea of using mathematics to understand what's really going on. But this method really only took off with the work of Galileo, the idea that it's not just a matter of describing what you see, but you can use mathematics to develop descriptions and explanations of what happens. Uh, Galileo invented not only mathematical science, but he also invented the idea of using the telescope. He didn't invent the telescope. That would already been invented by Dutch lens grinders, but what he did was come up with the idea that you could use the telescope as a way of studying the heavens with lo lots of amazing discoveries. As with the microscope, different kinds of mathematics have provided new methods and calculus has got new ideas and new hypotheses, but it's really a method for solving all sorts of different kinds of problems and the same with statistical inference. Um, so there's lots of examples. This is just 10 of the methods that are really important. I don't know if this is true, but I heard once that the best way to get a very large citation count is not just to have new ideas or hypotheses in science, but to come up with a method so that every time somebody uses your method, then they're gonna to have to cite you. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is useful. Uh, but what about art? Well, there's been loads of procedural creativity, advances in method and art as well. Here are just some examples. The idea that paintings should use uh, perspective rather than just being kind of flat the way that, that uh, earlier kinds of art were. Uh, the idea that you should take anatomy seriously, Leonardo da Vinci, was a universal thinker, a scientist as well as artist, but he used his uh, understanding of human anatomy to make his paintings more realistic. Uh, in other fields, in music, opera or jazz are examples of, of new methods. Uh, in, in, in literature, uh, science fiction was a new way of using, bringing science into, into novels. Uh, another form of artistic creativity in writing was stream of consciousness writing. Uh, had big influence on a lot of early 20th century writers like uh, Virginia Woolf and uh, James Joyce. Uh, so these are, are methods that once you come up with them, then you can start doing lots of other kinds of, of things as well. Okay, so that's what I think procedural creativity is. Uh, in my book, um, uh, Brain Mind, that just came out in February, I've got 50 examples of procedural creativity because I give 10 also from other areas, including social innovation, and, uh, and technological cases, invention, inventing new kinds of machines, for example, and also in, uh, in recreation. So there's loads of examples of procedural creativity to show that coming up with new methods really is a valuable thing to do. Okay, but now we want to understand it. What's going on in the mind when people come up with new methods? Well, what I show for all 50 examples of procedural creativity in brain-mind, that they can be expressed as rules. A rule that says, if you're in such and such a situation, then do this kind of thing. Um, so for cooking, for example, uh, what's, what's the rule for cooking? I mean, this doesn't sound like creative to you because you've all been cooking for a long time, or at least you know other people who cook. But cooking really was a big deal. No other animal cooks besides humans. And as I mentioned, this was really important for, for brain development. But it meant that somebody had to figure out that if you put your food in the fire and leave it for a while, then it starts to taste really good. And because it tastes really good, you're going to eat more of it. You get your calories really efficiently. The brain takes an enormous amount of your body's energy. It's only 1.5 to 2% of your body weight, but it takes up 20 to 25% of your energy. So that's why it was really important to have more efficient energy sources for brains to be able to... Uh, to develop. Uh, uh, so how does that work? Well, all these cases can be if-then, but it's really important not to think of them as just being linguistic. They're not just rules that are if-then, as in if this, w these words, then that word. Because a lot of kinds of procedural creativity, especially in art or music, but also in science and technology, involve what I'll call multimodal representations. By multimodal, I mean they use modalities that go beyond language. They have to be able to have things that are sensory motor, that involve perception, taste, smell, hearing, possibly even internal uh, physiological representations. And so the many methods require understanding them, not just in purely linguistic for form. 
Uh, even take something like cooking. You have to be able to think of, you can take the, the meat or the tuber or, the, or whatever you've got and then put it in the fire. This is something, and of course, that's also going to be multimodal. Um, so what we need to have is a way of understanding the if and then parts of all the if then rules that express methods represented in ways that aren't just language. Of course, language can be part of it, but it's got to be more than that. So how can we understand uh, extra linguistic uh, representations? Well, <laughs> the best way I know how to do this is with uh, Chris Eliasmus' idea of semantic pointers. Um, this is an idea that he came up with about 10 years ago. It's described in his amazing book called How to Build a Brain. And uh, as soon as he proposed it, I realized that this had implications for lots of different areas, including imagery. So let me tell you a bit about what semantic pointers are as a particular kind of neural representation. And then I'll indicate to you how it's useful both for multimodal representations and in particular for the kinds of multimodal representations that you need to capture the if and then part of, of procedural creativity. So what's a semantic pointer? Well, first of all, it's a pattern of neural firing. So you've got neurons, and one neuron by itself builds up a charge and fires, uh, or spikes, or has an action potential. And so it's, it's doing that kind of thing. But one neuron by itself doesn't do very much. It might be able to respond to a particular stimulus. But when you've got a bunch of neurons, like here I've got 10 neurons firing, or you get 10,000 neurons firing, or you get 86 billion neurons firing, Actually, 86 billion was the number that Susanna Herculana Huzel came up with when she figured out her brain soup methodology going. Once you've got 86 billion neurons rep rep representing, then you can really capture lots of complicated things and go way beyond uh, language. Uh, so how does this work? Well, Chris, in a whole bunch of, of simulations done with a bunch of wonderful, wonderful students and collaborators, has been able to show that you can provide an account of how neurons firing can actually be meaningful. They can operate like symbols. But they're not like just linguistic symbols because they not only have that, what he calls the shallow meaning of symbols being related to each other, they also get a deeper meaning of relation to the world by virtue of the fact that the neurons manage to retain some of the characteristics that came from the inputs from the environment. So whether it's visual or auditory, you've got inputs coming into your eyes, your ears, goes into the brain, neurons start firing. And semantic pointers can build up more and more complicated representations, but they hang on to some of the modal character of what went into them. And that, I think, is what the key is to understanding how they can be good for imagery and for multimodal representations. What Chris has been able to show in lots of different simulations is you can actually do things that are quite complex syntax using this. You can do language-like processing. But he's also provided ways of understanding how the, the semantic pointers can control the flow of information through the system. So what you get, I don't have time to explain it in any detail, is an account of how semantic syntax and pragmatics can all operate in the brain in a neurologically plausible way. Um, here's a picture that tries to sum up for you briefly what I think is going on in, uh, in semantic pointers. So here you've got these six circles. Don't think of those as six neurons. Think of them as 6,000 neurons or maybe 60,000 neurons and you've, or maybe even six million neurons. So you've got these neurons firing, sometimes in response to sensory matters because something's are coming into your eyes or your ears, sometimes because of motor matters because you're moving your arms around or your body. Uh, emotion, I think, is a big part of this because emotion is a big part of the pragmatics where emotions are evaluating what's going on. And of course, verbal can be part of it as well. But the key thing to producing the semantic pointers is you can bind these different things together. You can bind together into a common neural representation, sensory aspects, motor aspects, emotional aspects, and even verbal aspects. So you get this, this powerful kind of multimodal neural representation. And simulations have shown its effect in lots of different areas, including robots. OK, so semantic pointers is, I think, the guide, is the, is the key to understanding uh, multimodal rules. So I got a picture of a pizza up there. What's your concept of pizza? Well, it's not just uh, what it looks like or what it tastes like. It's not just that it's made of dough. It's all of these things. You can even have something that's sort of sensory motor when you think about what happens when you pick it up and fold it and try to eat it. Uh, so the cooking example here is if you want food to taste good, then put it in the fire for a limited time. That's the closest I can come to a rule about cooking. But keep in mind that it's multimodal because wanting is an emotion. Uh, 
the representation of food is tied in with how it tastes and how it smells. Your representation of tasting good, well, that's also emotional. Uh, putting it in the fire, well, that's sensory motor. That's putting it down and, and, and getting it into the embers of the fire, which is presumably how cooking originated. And even time. In rats, rats have a good sense of time for some purposes, and they've got neurons that fire specifically in order to keep track of, of time. So there's got neural representations of time as well. It's not just a matter of language. Uh, so a way I think to understand multimodal rules in general, and in particular the ones that are tied into the methods that are used in procedural creativity, is to think of them as multimodal rules built out of semantic pointers. Uh, so that's the idea of how representation works. So I'm going to introduce these basic ideas with respect to cooking, and then I'm going to show in parallel that it applies equally well to both arts, as represented by cubism, and also to science, as represented by brain soup. Okay. Um, okay, so how do we do this? How do we come up with new methods? I mean, nobody really knows how cooking originated. I think when I was a kid, we read a story about somebody inventing roast pig by burning down a house that had a pig in it. Uh, this, can't, this can't be right, because animals were domesticated only about 20,000 years ago, and cooking has been around, according to uh, Rangham and others, a, a million and a half years ago. How it came about, we don't really know. But one key part of creativity is what I call the combinatorial conjecture. This is this idea that all creativity requires combination of representations that were previously unconnected. It doesn't say what the representations are yet. They could be images, they could be concepts, uh, but this is, uh, I think, going to be true. I first got this idea from a book on creativity by Arthur Kessler a long time ago, but you can also find it in Margaret Bowden's work. I've been tracking the idea back, and as far, so far I've got it back to 1792. A Scottish philosopher named Dougal Stewart says a genius comes from combining representations. But you might wonder, is it true? Uh, years ago, I did a paper on creativity. I submitted it to a journal, and I said quite blithely, all creativity involves the combination of representations. And, and, some, and one of the reviewers rightly said, well, how can you say that? You've only got about four examples. You can't go from four to all. So what I did afterwards was get 100 examples of scientific discovery and 100 examples of technological innovation and show for each of them that the combinatorial conjecture applies. So now I'm, I'm pretty confident that it's, that it's true. Uh, all right, so that's what's going on. But what's a mental representation? Well, now, in accord with current views in theoretical neuroscience and the ideas spreading through cognitive science, I think of mental representations as patterns of neural activity. The semantic pointers is one powerful theory about how that might work, including visual and so on. Um, so if you think about cooking, in order to come up with the idea, oh, wait, I can cook my food. This is great. You need to be able to produce new combinations of food, fire, and put. Not just the words, but also the sensory motor uh, aspects of them as well. So I'm pretty sure that a key mechanism, I would say this for all creativity, but also for procedural creativity specifically, is combinations of ideas. Uh, example of this is Marie Curie up in the corner there, who was very creative in both physics and chemistry. She's one of the few people who got two Nobel Prizes because she was just really good at putting ideas together and new hypotheses, many of them about radioactivity. All right, so that's it. Uh, Generalization, I think, is really important. So how did, the people first, how did people first come up with the idea of cooking? Well, we don't really know, but I presume, almost by accident, somebody left some meat near the fire or left some tubers near the fire and tasted it and said, hey, that's not bad. Uh, and so by, by, probably by serendipity in that case, they just stumbled across something. But of course, once you've stumbled across something, you can generalize it. You can realize, oh, maybe this is going to be good for other things, and you can start putting other things in the fire until finally you get beer and pizza and everything else that <laughs> matters to life. Uh, so here's how this works. Uh, you've got an input, which is a goal, and a problem solution where you either by design or by accident manage to come up with a problem solution. But humans are really good at generalizing. We can go from one case to others very quickly. And in this case, we generalize into a rule that says, if you want to accomplish something, well, then use the series of steps that you just came across. If you want to eat food that tastes good, then put it in the fire, and then it will go on. And cooking is part of all human cultures. So what we need to be able to do is identify the steps that led to the goal, and then generalize them, but, of course, with multimodal representations. And there's lots of 
generalization going on in current machine learning, uh, but it tends not to use the multimodal representations. If you think of what goes on in deep learning, for example, it's very powerful at collecting lots of, uh, using lots of different examples to produce very powerful neural network representations, but it doesn't retain the multimodal aspect of it. It sort of throws that away, whereas I think the semantic pointers are important that you don't lose the crucial structure that's a part of the initial inputs. Uh, method two, generalization. Method three, analogy. So I mentioned analogy is how I came up with the, the brain day idea. Uh, well, here's a couple of other examples. On the left is uh, Jennifer Dudna. Uh, she's responsible for one of the most important methods in 21st century science, which is a method called uh, CRISPR. It's a way of doing genetic engineering that now is becoming widely used in medicine, widely used in biological research. She's got a wonderful book where she describes how she did it, and it's really clear from her work that analogy was a big part of it. I actually have a, a long account of how she did this in my book, uh, Brain Mind, chapter on creativity. Uh, so uh, another example of analogy seems to be Mendeleev. There's been lots of stories lately. Uh, this is a 150th anniversary of the invention of the periodic table by, by Mendeleev. How did he do that? Well, I haven't gone back to original sources to be sure that's true, but a bunch of the popular sources I'm saying said part of the reason that gave him the idea of laying out the, the uh, elements in the periodic table was actually by analogy. It said he was an avid player of solitaire. He played, he played patience, the game where you lay out the cards. And, and, and so that provided a kind of visual analogy, according to these accounts, for doing it. And keep in mind that, that both CRISPR and the periodic table are new ideas and new hypotheses, but they're also new methods. The periodic table is a method for understanding how the different uh, atomic elements can relate to each other. Um, OK, so what you do in the case of analogy is you take some previous method that works, playing cards, for example, or genetic engineering that was well established, and you figure out how to use new ideas to adapt it for an effective purpose. So I don't think that analogy is the basis for all creativity. Douglas Hofstadter has claimed that. But in the studies I did of the 200 examples of creativity in science and invention, it looked to me that roughly 15% were, uh, were had analogy as a major component. So that's not universal, but still, that's a pretty big important. So we want to figure out how analogy is going to work in the case of, of uh, developing new methods, in the case of procedural creativity. <clears throat> Okay, so now I've got this theory of how procedural creativity works. You need to have representations as multimodal rules. You need to have combinations of ideas. You need to have generalization or analogy, one of the two. Either one can do it for you. These can be the basic ideas. So now I want to show that art and science are, in fact, really quite similar with respect to the way that they use all three of these, all four of these things. So let's do the comparison. Um, so cubism, I've already mentioned, developed by Picasso and George Braque around 1907-1908, very radically different from art has done previously. That painting up there, I should have done a bigger version, is Les Demoiselles d'Avignon by Picasso done in, in uh, 1907, absolutely different from anything done before. Uh, various uh, w w uh, women portrayed in, in really extremely unusual ways. Uh, Brain Soup uh, by Susanna Herculana Huzel, uh, when she decided that she wanted to be able to count neurons well, she, had to, she didn't want to, want to slice them up and count little slices that people had tried before. She wanted to know how many neurons in a whole in a huge brain. And she came up with the idea that what you need to do is you take the brain and you have to fix the neurons using formaldehyde, and then you can uh, grind them up in a blender, but then you also have to be able to stain the neurons so you can count them. And it took her a number of tries. She's got a wonderful book published in uh, 2016 called the human advantage where she describes the methods that she did that. But once she figured out how to do it for rats, then she could generalize it. Then she could take it onwards. So, uh, so first of all, why are these creative? What is it to be creative? Well, there's a consensus in current research on, uh, on creativity that there are three typical features of creativity. I wouldn't call these necessary and sufficient conditions because I don't believe in that kind of definition. But the typical features are something has to be new, it has to be uh, surprising and it has to be valuable. And so we, if you want to judge something as being creative, you can use these three standards. And both these art and science examples meet those standards very well. But cubism was definitely new. In fact, a lot of people were kind of shocked by it. In fact, Picasso didn't even show 
Les Demoiselles d'Avignon for, uh, for years because he thought people would be just too shocked by it. But he did other things. So it was differently new. It was a different way of painting. It was certainly surprising. In fact, even shocking when people saw things like uh, the, the girl with the mandolin. Uh, but it was also valuable. And I'm going to talk a bit later about what the purpose of art is, what makes art valuable. But it's not just a matter of being beautiful. It's also a matter of generating other kinds of emotions. So one of my, I think one of the most uh, powerful of Picasso's production is Guernica, which he did to depict the horrors of the Spanish Civil War. And I wouldn't call it beautiful, but it has a huge emotional impact because it really captures the horrors of that, of that war. Uh, so I think it's valuable. Similarly, uh, Herculano Huzel was certainly new in that she gave the first accurate account of the number of neurons in humans and other kinds of brains. It was surprising because everybody thought they knew how many neurons there were in the brain, 100 billion, but nope, tur overturned that. Actually, even more surprising is what she found about glial cells. The estimates used to be that there were 10 times as many glial cells in the brain as there were neurons, but her answer is now is no, it's more one to one. Um, so that was, that was even more surprising. Uh, and valuable, because I think it really is important for understanding how brains function and how they evolve. Because what she's been able to do is to look at the number of neurons in different animals, different primates, at different stages of evolution, and get a much more detailed account of not just the number of neurons, but also the parts of the brain that they inhabit. So both of these things, I think, are, are I hope you'll agree, are highly creative. But the in question from the point of view of comparing art and science, are they creative in the same way? Well, I think they are. Um, so consider the cognitive representation. So up there is uh, the, the first painting by Georges Braque that marked uh, the beginning of Cubism independently of Picasso. This was something he did of houses in, in, a, in a stack uh, outside of Marseille. And I mean, this is a really original way of depicting a house. It doesn't even look like a house at all. In fact, people made fun of it. One of the commentators said, well, but why is George Bach producing all these little cubes? I mean, that's, where the, that's where the name cubism came from, because he was being made fun of for his little cubes. It's interesting that a lot of major artistic movements get named by people who are making fun of it. So, so impressionism was originally a, a, a word of abuse used in a review of the early impressionist painting, or, or, uh, or, or fauvism was uh, uh, between Impressionism and Cubism. And somebody made fun of it. It was just wild beasts. But anyway, what was supposed to be critical fun uh, turned into be the, the name of the movements, which were quite influential. So uh, that's George Brock. Uh, so here, this is only an approximation, obviously. But I think it captures a, a lot of what Cubists were doing. If you want to make striking paintings, then extract from reality using geometrical figures, such as cubes and triangles. So in Brock's work, he used a lot of cubes to represent what houses are. In that painting by Picasso, he used a lot of triangles to capture faces. It really distorted from the normal, normal look of, of uh, women, but that's what he was trying to capture. And some of their other works, they used, uh, they used uh, circles as well to abstract. OK, so I think that's a first approximation, at least, to a description of the method that they developed. Notice um, that it's. Uh, multimodal because, of course, cubes and triangles aren't just verbal concepts. They're things that we can have pictures of or you can even feel the difference. Okay, similarly, for brain soup, what uh, Herculano Huzel did was to come up with a new method. If you want to count neurons, then do the combination of things I mentioned, fix the brain parts in formaldehyde, liquefy them in a blender, stain the neurons, and then count them. Nobody had thought of how to do that, but it turns out to be quite powerful. But it also fits perfectly well as, as an if-then rule. Uh, but notice, as I said before, the cognitive representation in both cases is multimodal. That is, it's not captured just by words. It's also captured by, uh, by semantic pointers. I try to capture the semantic pointers here by putting them in brackets to indicate that I'm trying to indicate a neural representation capable of retaining some of the characteristics of the modality that's starting it. With wanting as being a matter of emotion, a painting isn't just a verbal concept. You all know what paintings look like. Uh, and striking, again, is emotional. Using, well, that's partly the physical process of painting. Cubes aren't just things that you can talk about in words. They're also things that you can visualize, and triangles as well. Similarly, the kinds of 
method that uh, Herculan Huzel came up with wasn't just a matter of having some mathematical or verbal technique. She had to be able to figure out to physically manipulate the brain cells of the, of the rats in order to be able to count them. And putting them in the blender was the easy part. You can put anything in a blender, but that's not always creative. Uh, I guess I, I, there's a YouTube version of people putting iPhones in blenders. I, that doesn't strike me as creative at all. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so the, member, the mechanisms I said that were important for producing these kinds of representations were combination, generalization, and analogy. Did they operate? Well, sure they did, because you wouldn't have a cubism, cubism unless you had the ability to combine visual concepts, such as geometrical shapes or abstraction, or more specifically, things like triangles and cubes. Similarly, in, for brain soup, that method of counting neurons, you had to be able to combine concepts like taking brains, liquefying them, uh, staining the neurons and counting them. So a whole bunch of different concepts went into them. So like the other 50, 200 examples I've actually looked at, this confirms what I call the combinatorial conjecture that creativity requires putting ideas together. Um, uh, generalization. Well, what, what generalizations were being made in order to do this? Well, in both cases, you had initial attempts. It was uh, Les Maisons de, de l'Estac of, of Braque and uh, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon of Picasso, they each around 1907 independently had something that was really different from art that went previously. But of course, they realized, because it was really striking and exciting, that they were onto something, and so they went on to produce many paintings uh, working closely together, and other people adopted the same kind of method. So the first discovery, the first thinking, oh, this is a really interesting, could be generalized and they could make it as an, into a general method. Similarly, it took uh, Herculane Huzel a fair amount of effort to figure out how to do rat brains, but once she got rid of, uh, overcome some of the glitches about fixing the neurons and was able to count them uh, quite reliably, then she was able to apply it to uh, dozens of other kinds of, of species and get this really nice overall picture about the course of primate uh, evolution. Even She's even done gorillas. Okay, so generalization was important. Uh, analogy. I think analogy operated in both of these cases. So this is an African mask. Both Picasso and Bach had been very impressed by exhibits of African art that had appeared in Paris uh, in the early um, 1900s. And you can see from this painting, from this African mask, it's really kind of different from the sorts of representations of what you can find. And if you look at this triangular shape of the mask and compare it with the pictures of the women in uh, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, then you can see, well, he was kind of tearing forward some of the ideas. Similarly, uh, in Brock's collection, he had some, somewhat cubic kind of masks. And he was able to possibly get some ideas about how he could represent houses from these African arts. So African art seems to have been one of the analogies that provided ideas to Picasso and Braque about how to do that. Another source of analogy that I'm not quite clear about because I don't know the history well enough seems to come from the work of Cezanne. Cezanne in these days was moving away from the Impressionist work he'd done earlier on into things that were actually more abstract and more geometrical. So it's quite possible that uh, Picasso and Braque, both of whom spoke very highly of Cezanne, may have been influenced by the way his work was trending away from the strictly uh, representational toward the more abstract. So you can have multiple analogies operating. Analogy doesn't have to be just one source and one analog. You can have multiple sources. In this case, I think these were different influences that were operating. Uh, analogies in brain soup, well, well, it's a metaphor, right? I mean, you can make soup in a blender. I've made soup in a blender. It's kind of fun. Uh, so presumably, it's much better than putting phones in a blender. So, so presumably, she was aware of that kind of blending technique. And so when she talks about brain soup, that's a metaphor, uh, but it's also an analogy. And so the idea that you should be able to get the neurons into a form where you can count lots and lots of them, uh, I don't know whether she doesn't explicitly say that she had lots of experience with blenders, but it could have been an analogy that applied. Um, OK, here's something I haven't talked about the nature of emotion and the role of emotion in creativity. This is really important, and you might think that, oh, emotion, that's something that artists do. For real scientists, a real technologist, oh, they don't have emotions, they're rational. Well, this is just an a entirely outmoded understanding of how the brain works. Uh, we know uh, for decades now, 
both from psychological work and also from neural work, that in the brain, emotion and cognition are really tightly interconnected. Uh, and so emotion plays a big role in both art and science. I wrote, well, more than 20 years ago, I, I published a paper called The Passionate Scientist, where I used, uh, I used James Watson's famous book, The Double Hel Helix, to an analyze the emotions that went into the discovery of DNA. And lots of other things have documented the same thing. So I think emotion is really a key part of creativity. It's important for creativity in a bunch of ways. First of all, it helps to focus attention, indicate what's important. It provides a constant ongoing way of evaluating what you're doing. This is good or that's not good. It also provides a way of indicating how you should communicate with other people, what's exciting enough to do that. And you'll see in both these cases that there are really important emotions. I could have expanded this, this a lot for, for Picasso and Brock to do, to do um, what they did. It required a lot of audacity. I think probably the main reason that Picasso is more famous for Cubism than Brock is just that he was much more outgoing and personable and, and, uh, and willing to uh, put himself out there. Uh, but you also needed to have excitement of what they were doing. So artists, highly emotional, because you're seeing, oh, I'm onto something here. Oh, this is interesting. It's different from what's before. That's new and exciting. But exactly the same thing operates in the minds of, of scientists. Uh, so the Doudna book on the discovery of CRISPR is really great about this, because she describes how at the different stages, she, would, uh, she and her collaborators could get really excited about a particular different way of understanding how you might be able to use what's known about bacteria to manipulate uh, different kinds of, of, of organisms. Uh, so emotion is a big part of it as well. But again, this doesn't distinguish art from science. You've got the same kinds of emotions operating in both cases to fix people's attention and to evaluate how they're doing. Finally, I should mention there's an important social process in both of these. We have the kind of view of genius as somebody working alone uh, completely autonomously turning out ideas out of nothing. Well, that's not true. Creativity is a highly social process as well. In fact, in the, in the, the book, the second book, the Mind Society book, I've got a chapter on creativity in Apple that describes how Apple has managed to be such a creative country, com a company for such a long time, emphasizing not just the individual cognitive processes, which I've been talking about today, but also the social processes of getting smart people together and having them combine ideas. Well, you might think that art isn't a social process, but it is. I mean, artists talk to each other all the time. They go spend times in artist colonies. In the case of Picasso and Brock, they shared a studio. They independently came up with the idea of using geometrical figures. But then for seven years, they actually shared a studio and were constantly watching what, what the other was doing. And so the development of cubism was a, a social process, like most other kinds of creativity. Similarly, Herculana Huzel describes many students and many colleagues who played a big role in her being able to develop her ideas. She's, uh, and the same was true for Jennifer Doudna and CRISPR. And these were all team efforts as most creativity is today. So I don't want to give the impression that creativity or pre procedural creativity is just a matter of individual minds. We all depend very much on the people we interact with and can come up with ideas that are better than we would have been able to do all by ourselves. Okay, uh, the one difference, and I've been talking about similarities between art and science, but of course they're not exactly the same. And I think the big difference is not neural processes. I think I've made the case that the neural processes are the same in both, but there's differences in goals. So what's the goal of art? Well, this is uh, what I address in the chapter on aesthetics in the natural philosophy book I just published. I used to think that art was about beauty, uh, but I realized that was just superficial. Beauty is only one of the emotions. I think. A lot of Picasso's cubist work isn't actually beautiful, but it's important and striking nevertheless. So there's a lot of different emotions that art. So I think the purpose of art is primarily to produce emotionally engaging paintings or works of music or, or dance forms, and so it's in, to engage the emotions. Um, science also engages the emotions, but that's not the, the major purpose of science. Like the major purpose of science is to come up with findings that are true, that are explanatory, tell you how things work, and that are useful for improving human welfare. So it's different goals. So I think that science and, and artists are out to do different things, but when they're doing that, when they're being creative, they're using the same kinds of neural processes. Okay, this is the commercial. These are the books that came out in February. And they're all, they've all got chapters on creativity. So the procedural creativity is in brain-mind. 
The one on Apple and social creativity is in Mind Society, and Natural Philosophy has a chapter on aesthetics, which talks about creativity in painting and music in a lot more detail than I did today. Okay, so let me conclude. Um, I hope I've convinced you that an important part of creativity is the generation of new methods, that what we think of a method, we can understand it cognitively and neurally as a matter of multimodal rules, rules that involve representations that aren't just linguistic, that there are mechanisms that operate in coming up with a number of different kinds of creativity, but also procedural creativity, operating by combining ideas, by generalizing from small numbers of experiences, even just one, or also by applying analogies. And that if you look at this kind of analysis, you can see that from the point of view of mental mechanisms, from the point of view of the representations and processes in the mind, from the point of view of what neurons are doing in the brain, art and science are fundamentally the same. Thank you. No, no, you handle them. <laughs> yeah. um, well, could you posit that uh, art and science share the same goal as constructing new sense, sort of have creativity partially characterized as problem solving? Um, sure. I mean, I mean, it's not that creativity is problem solving, it's just problem solving and you do it really well is creative because you come up with solutions that you didn't have before. So at the highest level, if you think of the problem to be solved by the artist is to produce something that for the artist and lots of other people will be emotionally engaging, yeah, then they would be similar. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of different levels of abstraction you talk about. At the simplest level, you could just have one neuron or a few neurons responding to some kind of external stimulus, a red object, for example, get some neurons firing. But as you move into the other layers of the brain that's described in the previous talk, you get more and more abstraction. So you'll be able to combine representation of red with representation of cup to get red cup. Um, and so that requires binding red and cup together to get red cup. But then you can have further levels of abstraction as well. Here I think actually you get an interesting difference between what humans can do and what other animals can do and what humans can do and what current artificial intelligence programs can do. Because they can all do uh, some layers of abstraction. But what's amazing about the human mind, and might be part of computers someday but isn't yet, is you can get abstractions from abstractions from abstractions. So what humans are able to do, largely by conceptual combination, is to go from red cup to drinking vessel to household object and get lots of different things. And what human thinking can do to get even farther away from experience is get abstractions so you no longer have something that corresponds to reality. So if you get ideas like an atom or ideas like a god or ideas like justice, you have to do lots and lots of uh, further abstraction. But I think that's all happening in the same way. It's all by combination. It's just because humans have these 86 billion neurons, we're able to do abstractions from abstractions to abstractions and do combinations that go way beyond what animals can do. Oh, here's another application. Uh, I use Toyota's idea of just-in-time manufacturing in my research. I figured out this a long time. When I read about just-in-time manufacturing, I thought, well, that's a good way to do research. There's, students are often told, well, you got to do a literature review. A literature review, literature review is a huge mistake because all you're going to do by doing your literature review first is find out what everybody else is doing. What I, and, if, and of course, by the time you actually come to do your own research, you'll have forgotten the literature review anyway. Um, so I, I have this method that I've used over and over again for many decades that I call just-in-time reading. That I try to do the reading 
for a particular part of a research project just before I'm working on that part of the project, just before I'm writing it up. So this is a case of another level of abstraction where the, the manufacturing idea, I think, turns into a good piece of research advice. But using analogies and using these kinds of higher level abstractions, I think those are major parts that have made people capable of taking over the world. Well, empirically, there does seem to be a difference. Think about linguistic uh, complexity. So you can have really complicated sentences like, uh, the boy chased the cat, chased the dog, but you get lost fairly soon. And actually, I think Chris's work provides an explanation for why you get lost at some point. Because his work on binding, where you take different representations and you bind them to others, but the binding isn't done just in the abstract. It's done by neurons. But what he's found in his simulations is it takes a lot of neurons to do the binding. And of course, we got a lot of neurons. We got 86 billion, which is why I think we can do bindings of bindings of bindings that even chimpanzees uh, can't do with 26 billion or something like that. But well, there's limits. Our brains are big, but they're still limited. And so I think that provides a, uh, uh, maybe not a limit on overall creativity because you can bind things into ideas and then bind those again. But it does make it hard for us to keep more than four or five or six things in mind at well. And I think that's a function of just not just the number of brains we have absolutely, but the number of brains we have in the prefrontal cortex, which is really important for executive uh, processes and for multimodal kinds of, of processes. So, so we're limited there. I wonder, I, I don't think we're at all threatened by animals because it takes a long time for animals to evolve. Uh, but with artificial intelligence, if the programs get smarter than they are right now, and given the huge kinds of computer memories that are possible, you might be able to have a computer and that isn't as shackled to binding capacities, and so you might at some point have, have more creative computers than humans. That's not true now. I mean, there are some really creative computers like AlphaGo and, uh, and IBM Watson, Chef, Chef Watson I think is kind of cool. So there already is some computer creativity, but I think it's, it's not operating at the kinds of range that humans can, but that may change uh, over time. And getting around the limitations of binding could be a big part of that. Oh, sure. I think in almost all these cases, people aren't thinking, hmm, I need a new method. Yeah. I mean, could, because that's such a vague goal. Uh, how would you even do that? But what happens, I think more commonly, is the generalization process. That in working on something, a new painting by Picasso, or, uh, or um, a particular method in the case of Hercule and Huzel, you're fiddling around with stuff, and you manage to put something together in a novel combination of representations. And then you think, oh, that's interesting. What else can I apply that to? And so that's how the, how the, the generalization occurs. But I don't think it's very often that anybody sets out, I need a new method. How would you, even, or even, I'm going to create a new style of painting, or I'm going to create a new genre of music. Uh, you'd have to be both grandiose and probably not very, <laughs> not very smart to, to try to do that. On the other hand, people who are working in art or music or science are fiddling around with things all the time, trying to solve little problems, and that's interesting, that's interesting. And then they've got the capacity, which is both cognitive and emotional, to realize, oh, that works, that's exciting, and so that's worth, that's worth generalizing. The main other one that I could think of would be mutation. Um, so rather than kind of combining two new things together, having something slowly mutate or change into a new idea. And maybe one reason that this is kind of more overlooked sometimes is I think it sometimes takes kind of multiple or many iterations or even generations. And so in something like art, you might see this kind of from over the course of many artists 
there will be a new kind of field that will emerge, not because anybody brings in kind of some new big idea, but they all have their own little personal modifications, and eventually that creates a new subfield. Have you looked at? I, 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 yeah, I've, I've thought of that. So there's two ways in which the combinatorial conjecture could be false. One is if there's no representations at all, if there are no mental representations. And there are philosophers and even a few cognitive scientists who propose that. But I think that's, not, that's a non-starter because there's so much about human problem solving and thinking, and especially creativity, that requires it. But the other way is the mutation way. And I, I certainly thought of that because my first book on induction was co-authored with John Holland, who's the inventor of genetic algorithms. And genetic algorithms introduce two different ways of getting new structures. I mean, they're basically rules, and you get new structures in. One is by crossover, which is basically a combination mechanism, but the other is mutation. And of course, he was inspired by genetics, and that happens in, in biology. So there, you don't need to have combinations of, of genes. You can just have one gene changes because the proteins are being, uh, are being changed inside. Uh, so that's the DNA is being changed. So, is mutation important for understanding creativity in art and science? I haven't found a single example that that's true. I haven't found a single example where the best way to understand creativity is to suppose there's one structure that just gets tweaked internally. I found hundreds of examples that require combinations of different ideas, but I haven't found a single example where it looks like it's a mutation in a particular structure. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't any. There may be, but I've never found any where just a mutation and a representation would be enough to do it. So it's a possible additional mechanism, but whereas the combination operates in hundreds of cases, mutation, if it occurs, I think is pretty rare. Ivana, do you have an example? Well, I was thinking whether just the role of randomness is something that is the early stage of biology, and hence still hasn't been done. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a reasonable conjecture, and there's still people maintaining it. One of the leading psychologists working on creativity is Dean Simonton. And he's still maintaining, and he was inspired originally by uh, evolutionary ideas, that you, creativity is random mutation. There's still lots of people who think there's a good analogy between creativity and biological evolution. And so he tries to make the case that bl bl blind uh, randomness is part of, but I don't think that's true. Because in all these cases, people are operating in cognitive situations, they've got problems they're trying to solve, and it's not as if it's somehow predetermined that they get the right answer, but they're trying to solve problems, it's helping them to focus, emotions are a big part of this, they've got some idea of what's interesting and what's important, and that provides a guide to what might be put together. So I wouldn't call it random, sometimes it's an accident because you've got causal chains that intersect, but I haven't found any plausible cases where, where randomness actually provides an explanatory role. Human Problem solving is not guaranteed to get a solution, but because it's focused by emotion, it's focused by goals, I think it's, it's much more constrained than theories of randomness would be. And biological mutation, obviously different. No matter what predicament you put an organism, organism is, there's no increase that will have the right kind of mutation based on that predicament. That's the Lysenkoism that's been discredited. But on the other hand, humans are intentional. We're trying to do different sorts of things. So I think that human creativity is very different from the kind of randomness that occurs in biological mutation. Just to extend that, I think you quite naturally focused on major axis creativity, big creativity, because there must be a spectrum. Your creativity can produce major advances, okay, minor advances, both like and to down to rather trivial advances. And you could imagine a field where a series of very trivial, almost immeasurably small acts of creativity would progress the field in a very small incremental way that might look like mutation. So do you, do you agree with the idea that creativity has a spectrum and that there is a, a situation where you can have very small acts of creativity? Oh, sure. Uh, we had, I, 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 I have no aspirations of doing something as good as the periodic table. <laughs> I, think, I think I've come up with some new methods occasionally, but they're not the same degree. So that's, that's I hope, is maybe mid-range. And down at the lower level, there's, there are a little acts of creativity that could go into every paper that you do. It's putting together things in different ways. So it could be, it could, yeah, there's definitely gradations. And there's also a distinction commonly made between what's creative for the world and what's creative just for you. I remember when I was an undergrad, I was, uh, Constantly, well, constantly, I would often come up with new ideas and I'd propose them to my supervisor, and he said, oh, Carnap bid in 1933. 
And so this is the problem of being an undergraduate because you don't know what's out there. And so even if you're clever enough to come up with new ideas, somebody's already got them. But then hopefully you get to the point where you know enough way around, so where you can do something that's more creative than generally. But it would be very interesting if it were possible to look at the more mundane creativity and do what I did for these major kinds and see whether the combinatorial conjecture applies there. I, I think that's an open question. You know, huge mess of experiences of things you understand, and, you know, things you know do things certain ways. And creativity is sort of the, the process by which we kind of scroll through this mess of stuff and methodically choose this, 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 and this, and, you know, stick them together and create something new we've never seen before. Or maybe it's not a methodical thing, a thing where we just kind of grab this, 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 and this and garble them together, and, you know, sometimes it turns out nice. Is that the, like, what we mean when we say creativity? Well, I, yeah, I, well, I avoid talking about essences. Essences are, yeah. don't, essences don't exist. But there are common things to create, instances of creativity. You produce something that's new, valuable, and surprising. How do you do that? Well, it can have various degrees of being methodical. And sometimes you're just noodling around and you stumble across something. Other times you're consumed by a problem and you're really trying to solve it and then you put things together. So. It involves, in all these cases, you come up with something that's new, surprising, and valuable by virtue of putting together ideas that hadn't been connected before. Okay, yes, yeah, so I, I do understand exactly that. But then the process of creativity, though, it can be you know, structured and methodical the way in physics. You know, if you have enough data, you can look at it and logically just crunch it down into a nice conclusion. Whereas, you know, in art, you know, when you're making a painting out of cubes, I mean, there's no logical mm. way of doing that. It's just kind of saying, oh, here's some well, but, but, but yeah, I, think you've got a, I think you've got a narrow view of science. Einstein, for example, said he came up with ideas about real, real, relativity by imagining himself oh, yeah. riding on a beam of light. He said his ideas came by imagery, not by mechanical yeah, calculation. No, I, 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 I yeah. would say that's more of an artistic. Well, but it's also really important for science to be able to yeah. take that kind of new idea and then transform it into something that's more mathematical and connected with experience. But what I'm trying to say, though, is sometimes when we you know, fuse these ideas or these experiences together, sometimes we can look at it and it makes sense why I should do that. But in other cases of creativity, I mean, we just kind of stick things together to see what happens. That's kind of what I'm talking about. And that's where the randomness slash mutation thing. Well, I, I wouldn't call it randomness. I'd call it accident. Okay. Because yeah, exactly. you happen to have one idea. This is why I always like having more than one research project at one time, because it's happened more than once that I had research project A and research project B, and then I realized, oh, wait a minute, they're connected. And then suddenly I've got something I wouldn't have had otherwise if I wasn't doing two research projects. Now, is that random? No, because it's a matter of the psychological neural process of combining the ideas, but it's a, it's a happy accident in the sense that I was interested in A and I was interested in B, and then realized that there were interconnections there that uh, uh, wouldn't, I wouldn't have seen otherwise. So it's so surprising even to the to the creator, but it's not it's not random. 